the communication of the church. I, I thought about many different ways to title the message tonight, and I thought about the word communication because uh, the communication, listen, if, if we're going to turn our community upside down, then we have to communicate with our community. We have to share the message of Jesus Christ to our community. No other message is going to change people. Only the message of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ is really going to make a difference in our community. And so let me ask you a couple of rhetorical questions. Those are questions that don't need an answer because the answer is already so obvious. Uh, would you agree with me that we have a message worth sharing? And would you agree with me that we have received something as far as the gospel that all people need to hear? And so we must communicate that truth. We must communicate the gospel with those around us. If we're going to uh, turn our world upside down, we can do nothing less and nothing more than to preach the gospel, of course, to every creature. I want to give us tonight uh, th three quick thoughts on this idea of the communication of the church. Look in verse 14 and verse, uh, through verse 16. I want you to notice the particulars of the gathering. The people, they are gathered together in the synagogue. And I'll mention that in just a moment. But the people are gathered together. And Paul is going to, uh, he's going to preach to them in just a moment. And I think about this gospel that you and I have. This gospel that you and I have heard so many times. This gospel that you and I have, uh, have received is what we need to be preaching to everybody we come in contact with. Notice in verse 14, the synagogue, the Bible says, but when they departed from Perga, they came uh, to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue. If you'll take time, we don't have near enough time tonight, but if you'll take some time and study as Paul traveled from place to place to place, he, he, he quite frequently visited and went to the synagogue. He went to what we would call today the, the, the house of God. He went to the church. He went to the place where uh, people were gathered together now. It could, have been, it could have been a house where he went where folks were gathered together. It could have been an outdoor market area where folks were gathered together. But here we find out he went specifically to the, the synagogue. I think this is, uh, as you read through this, we may kind of skip over that because we're just reading through that. But it's very important we realize the importance of, uh, of those who are gathered together. They met at the synagogue. Here's what we can say in 2016. They went to church. They gathered in the house of God. They, they, they gathered together with their families down at the church because that's where the preaching was taking place. That's where the, uh, the work was going on. I remember from the movie last night, those of you who came, the lady, she says, well, I go to church occasionally. And the old lady, she said, why does your pastor only preach occasionally? Uh, that was her way of saying, you ought to be there every time you can. Uh, and listen, we ought to be here every time we can, and praise God you're here tonight. But the people, they, they were able to turn their world upside down they, because they met at the synagogue, and they got, if you will, their marching orders. They got the gospel preached to them, and the message that was preached to them, the gospel, they, they took it out into the community. Uh, think about the synagogue. Think about how there's just something very special about the house of God. I think about how uh, this was a day, and of course there were, there were plenty of Jews there. There were, there were also those low-life Gentiles were there, and they, they would gather together. It's interesting, they would kind of gather together in the same place. And I thought about how our church is that way. On a Sunday morning, I, I don't even, would even begin to guess uh, how many different kinds of people here. There's tall people, there's short people, there's... there's Smart people, there's not so smart people, there's good looking people. There's not so good looking people. There's white people, there's black people, there's Spanish people, there's American people, there's people from just all different kind of backgrounds and all different kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of places and, and colors and creeds. And, but the thing about this is, 
Paul didn't change what he preached depending on the crowd he preached to. No, he always preached the same thing. He preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ down at the church house. And I think about how we think about the bus kids who come here. We think about the visitors who come here. We think about the church, uh, the, the church members who come here. The message you and I need to hear and to take out with us is all the same. Whether we're an old person or a young person or a short person or a tall person, whatever we come from, our color, our creed, our nationality, our background, our educational level. Listen, it's all the same. As we come here to church together, you know what we are? We're one big happy family. And we need to hear the same gospel uh, no matter where we are, where we come from. I think about the synagogue. I think about also the scripture. Look in verse 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, they placed a pretty... Uh, pretty high level of importance on the Scriptures. And can I say, the most important thing that we do around here revolves around the Scriptures. Now, I know we all who preach and all who teach Sunday school lessons, we may find an illustration from a magazine or from a, 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 a website, or we may, you know, hear something somebody else said. Uh, but, and, and all that's good to illustrate and to kind of bring thoughts together. But the most important thing around here is the Word of God. From the Sunday school class to the children's church to over here in big church, the most important thing we have is the Word of God. And notice what the Bible says and after the reading of the law and the prophets. The first thing they did when they gathered together is somebody stood up and read from the Scriptures. Now, they didn't open up their black uh, black leather Schofield uh, uh, study Bible. No, they probably unrolled a scroll or, or uh, unrolled uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the scroll and they looked at the, the, the Old Testament and the law of Moses and things about Abraham. And, and, but that was their scripture. That was their Bible. They placed their importance. The first thing they did was to read together uh, the scriptures. And can I say, whatever we do around here, if it's... If it's, if it's revolving around the Scripture, then it's going to be good. And if, if it's revolving around the Word of God, then it's going to work. Listen, we cannot underestimate the power and the value and the importance of the Word of God. If we don't include the Word of God in what we do, then we are wasting our time. And the message we have that we can share with our community and with our world ought to come with, from the pages of this Bible because it's this Bible that reveals to us, first of all, our need to be saved. The reason you know you needed to be saved is because Jesus said, the Bible said in, in the Word of God that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's not just a, a wives' tale. That's just not uh, just an old fable. No, listen, it's truth from the Word of God. And we know about God. We know about heaven. We know about hell. We know about the Old Testament prophets. We know how to live and how to raise our children. We know how to have a good marriage. We know all that we need to know how to live for Jesus. Jesus Christ from the pages of this Bible. The Bible is very, very important. We need to think about the synagogue and think about the Scripture. And then look in verse 16. Notice the sermon. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hands said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. It comes time for the sermon. Now I didn't know this. I did a little study this past week. And I realized something, and I hope this is true because I think it's what I studied. Uh, I believe that in the, in the day in which this was written, there would be preachers who would come around from different areas, and they'd stop by, and they'd preach. Somebody would read the Scripture, and then there'd be some preaching. So there was a very high important, importance put on the sermon. Now, bless y'all's hearts. Y'all have to hear sermons from me. Nowhere near like Paul preaching or Peter preaching or some of the great men of God in those days. But we gather here in our church. Yes, we love the music. And yes, we love the handshaking time. And yes, we love to be able to give our offerings and to have time together. But the most important thing we'll do this morning and tonight is listen to the sermon. 
In, in children's church, the most important thing they have over there is the sermon. Uh, oh, they have candy. Praise God for candy. I think today they gave away cupcakes. What a blessing to give, give away cupcakes. But the most important part of this morning's service in here and in, the, and in children's church and tonight is the sermon. Somebody, somebody asked me one time, well, so what do you do all week? And I wanted to say, well, how long do you have so I can tell you what we do all week? And then the conversation got to, well, of all that you do, what's the most important thing you do? And I was kind of like, hmm. Well, I got to say, the most important thing that I can do is to prepare our sermons. Oh, yeah, we got to pray, and, and we do that, and we, you know, we need to visit, we need to make phone calls, we have business things to do and things to plan. But the most important thing that I'll do all week is prepare the three sermons a week. And the most important things you'll do today is to hear the sermons. And those of you who preach, most important thing you'll do today is to preach your sermons. Praise God for the choir singing. Uh, praise God for those who take the offering. Praise God for those who ride, uh, drive the buses and all that and teach Sunday school. But it all revolves around the sermon. We have out tracts, we give invitations, it's to get people in to hear the sermon, and I'll, and I'll say this again, it's just too bad you have to listen to me and not somebody else, but the sermon is what makes the difference, the sermon is what, uh, is what compels folks to want to do something for God, it's the sermon, and so it all revolves around the sermon, listen, they stood up, and they read the Bible, and they got together, and then Paul here in this case, but somebody stood up, and they preached. We got a, a, a thing in the mail yesterday. You may have got one too if you live in McDonough. Advertising uh, the relevant church. They have a new campus. I think some are down near Locust Grove. And it said, come to our Easter service. And they had pictures on there of a playground and of the Easter bunny and uh, some other kind of doodads for kids. But there was not the first bit of scripture on there. They said nothing about come hear a message from whoever he or she, their preacher is. And you, you know, what's most important around here is, of course, the preaching of the Word of God. Our opinions don't matter. Our philosophies don't matter. What's most important is the Scripture and, uh, and the sanctuary and, uh, and, and the sermon. That's what Paul was focused on. The church in that day made a difference. The church in that day turned their world upside down because the people of God came together and they came to the, to the, uh, to the, to the sanctuary. They came to, to hear the Scriptures and they came to hear a sermon. So the particulars of the gathering and then notice the most important thing from our text is the preaching of the gospel. Look in verse 26 and following. I'm just going to read uh, the first two verses. Uh, men and brethren, here's the sermon. Here's what Paul's preaching. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which they read, uh, are read every Sabbath, Day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Here comes the message. Here comes Paul's sermon to this church that took it out and made a difference. He talked about, first of all, he talked about, notice the appeal. He's appealing. In a sense, he's asking. He's saying, pay attention. What I'm going to say to you is very important. He's saying, listen up. Uh, clear your minds and, and clear your hearts and get ready to hear what the Bible says to us. Get ready to hear the message. He's appealing here to the Jews because they look to Jesus uh, but his message isn't reserved for them alone. The message is for all those who are here. Yes, there's Jews and yes, there's Gentiles all gathered together and he appeals to whoever it is that fears God. It's a universal message of salvation. I think about, uh, I think about how our message is not just reserved for folks who look like us. Our message is not just for those who act like us and those who live like us and those who dress like us and those who smell like us. Our message is to, is to everybody. You've all heard of selective hearing. And some of us have selective hearing. It's amazing how our children, 
they'll not hear you when you say, okay, come help with the dishes. But they'll hear when it says, okay, y'all can play video games tonight on a school night. Oh, they hear that? Or we husbands? If our wife would say something like this, uh, would you come help me with the kids? Huh? I didn't hear you. But when they say, it's time to eat, oh, we hear them. We have selective hearing. I know you may not, but I know I do sometimes. Selective hearing is no good. Nobody wants to be around uh, people who have selective hearing. Uh, nobody wants to be around those who only hear what benefits them. And while many of us are, 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 are guilty of selective hearing, Hearing, what a shame when we're guilty of selective witnessing. The Bible is clear that all people are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But for some reason we like to witness to those who may not need it. If that's even said right, I don't know. Uh, we like to witness and talk to those who may look like us and act like us and live like us, but sometimes we have a pretty hard time witnessing to those who don't look like us. But the Bible is very clear. Paul here, he's appealing to all people, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you uh, feareth God, there's the appeal. And then notice there's the admission. He's talking here about, uh, about those who, 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 who don't believe so much in who Jesus is. He's talking about those who kept the rituals and those who believed in, uh, in, in worshiping under the, the, uh, the, the, the rituals of Abraham and all of those things. And think about this, though. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul even called himself that. Paul, at one time, was from the sect of people whose job was, their desire was, to, to, to wipe Christianity off the map. Remember, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, I think chapter 9, that Paul was on his way to Damascus to, 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 uh, to arrest Christians for just being Christians. And so if there's anybody who knows a little bit about, uh, about tradition, and anybody knows a thing about, about uh, keeping rules and rituals, it was Paul. And Paul says, that's not our message. Our message is not uh, keeping rules and rituals. Our message is all about the gospel. Now listen, he knew some would not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he realized that all would not receive the gospel, but still his intention, his goal, his job, his desire was that everybody, hear about Jesus Christ. I think about our message. Uh, not everybody we witness to is going to respond. Not everybody we give a track to is going to come to church that Sunday. Not everybody we give a visitation card to is going to visit our church. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be nice everybody you witnessed who got saved. It'd be nice everybody that you gave a track to would read that track and write there, trust Christ be their Savior. It'd be nice if everybody you gave an invitation card to would be in church the next Sunday, but it's just not going to happen that way. Uh, 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 Paul, think about Paul, his message, he knew not everybody would hear. He knew not everybody would respond and react, but he still preached the message. He still gave the gospel. Uh, he'd been rejected many times, I'm sure about that, but he kept on going. He kept on preaching. He kept on teaching. He kept on witnessing. And I say it to you tonight, there may be somebody you've been witnessing to for years. You've been praying for them. You give out tracts everywhere you go. You've passed out 15 bundles of invitation cards. Praise God for that. But not everybody you've witnessed to has come to church. But can I say to you, keep on doing it. Keep on passing them out. Keep on preaching. Keep on witnessing because someday somebody is going to respond. I think about... And you've all heard this, I'm sure, many times. But the man who gave me a track in the summer of 1991, uh, talking to him later, I called him after I was saved. And uh, I basically just thanked him for passing out tracks there at work. And he did, this for, he did this every Friday for 19 years. Gave out a track to everybody who worked at the place where we worked. And we talked about later how he... Feel, he, he uh, thinks he gave out about 90,000 tracts in those 19 years. And he said, as far as he knew, I was the only one in 19 years, 90,000 tracts to be saved because of his witnessing. 19 years. 
every Friday to everybody who worked there at Fairbanks in Rome, Georgia. 19 years, every Friday. And there's no doubt he got discouraged. There's no doubt he thought, well, this is my last week doing this. I'm tired of passing out tracts. I'm tired of witnessing. I'm tired of preaching the gospel. I'm tired of all this. It, it just, it's not working. I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. Nobody's hearing what I have to say. And here comes this 19-year-old dude who calls him back and says, Mr. Bill, thank you for giving me the tract because I got saved this past weekend. Think about how he wasn't concerned about the fact that I was the boss's son. He didn't care about the fact that I was just there to work in the summer. He only was concerned about the fact that he wanted to make a difference in somebody's life, so he gave out a track. He didn't care that every other Friday I threw the track away. He didn't care about that. He kept on giving me those tracks. And I thought about, you know what, what if he'd have been so discouraged, and what if he would have stopped the Friday before he gave me the track he gave me? Well, I'd still be lost, probably. <clears throat> so let me say to you, you never know who the next person you witness to is going to be. You may give out a track to somebody who could be your next pastor. You never know. So keep on giving out tracks. Keep on witnessing. And, and Paul, uh, and Paul uh, we, we get this from Paul here. He don't know who's going to get saved. He don't know who's going to respond. But he does know this. Uh, I want to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach and teach to all those I come in contact with. There's the appeal. There's the admission. Notice the, there's the affirmation. Look in verse 28. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. He goes on here to talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, he doesn't preach his opinion. He doesn't preach his personal philosophy. He, he doesn't preach that works saves because works doesn't save. He doesn't preach that, uh, that baptism saves. No, because he knows baptism doesn't save. He, he doesn't preach the ways of the world to get folks saved. No, he preaches about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And can I say this? That has to be our message. We have to preach the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And folks aren't always going to like it. Folks aren't going to agree with it. Folks aren't going to always accept it, but our job is not to give out an acceptable gospel. Our job is not to give out a pleasing gospel. Our job is to give out the gospel, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what Paul did. It's what Peter did. It's what the early church did. And the Bible says they turned the world upside down. I read this the other day and I, I think it goes well here. It says, when we feel that we must be like the world... To win the world, we haven't won the world, but the world has won us. So our message, we can't compromise our message. We can't give into the world. We can't embrace the world. We must preach the gospel to the world. The particulars, the preaching, notice finally the prominence of the gospel. Look in verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul now has officially ruffled feathers. Because gathered there were Pharisees, gathered there were the Sadducees, gathered there were the, were the Jews, gathered there were those who thought they were special people because their father was Abraham. And there are special people gathered there that thought, you know, our way is the best way. Uh, there's people there who were Judaizers. They thought, yeah, you, you get saved by trusting Christ, but you've got to keep on doing good deeds and keep on doing the rituals and keep on uh, doing the certain deeds and keep on doing these certain items to stay saved. And here Paul says, no. Now Paul's a whole lot more delicate probably than we are. 
uh, if, if we were there, we may say, no, you bunch of liars, you're believing a lie from the devil. It's not true. Those things you're believing are not true. Paul didn't do that. All Paul said was, in order for you to get saved, in order for you to find salvation, it must be found in, in Jesus Christ. It must be found in Him. And by Him, all that believe are justified from all things which ye, ye could not be justified from the law of Moses. The law of Moses couldn't save you. The law of Moses couldn't forgive you of your sins. And here's Paul, this itinerant preacher, this guest preacher, he comes to town. This, uh, this uh, evangelist comes to town. And here he's ruffling feathers. He's saying, you must trust Christ. You must believe on Him. You must trust Christ to be your Savior. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to be saved, you must trust Christ. And here's all these Jews. Didn't like it a bit. <clears throat> the prominence of the gospel you know, not everybody's going to like our message. Not everybody's going to agree with our message. Not everybody's going to accept our message. Our message is going to make some folks mad. Listen, some folks, you tell them if they don't get saved, they're going to go to hell. They're going to get mad at you because you're going to ruffle their feathers especially those from a religion that teaches, well, if you'll just do this certain list of seven or eight rules, then maybe after you die, your family can give enough indulgences and your family can do enough praying. And if you've done all these good deeds and if you hang the rosary from the right spot on your mirror and if you have the cross displayed on a certain place in your house and if you'll look to this Mary to help you get to, to, to God, then if you tell folks that believe that about Jesus Christ's way to salvation, you're going to ruffle their feathers. You tell someone who believes that in order to find peace with Allah then you've got to strap a bomb to yourself and go somewhere in some public crowd and detonate that bomb and kill you and everybody else and your reward is 72 virgins. You tell somebody that, that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation, you're going to ruffle their feathers. You, you tell somebody who believes in keeping, uh, living a certain way and, and, and praying to a certain direction and, and, and keeping a certain, uh, a certain kind of lifestyle and wearing a certain type of clothing and doing and not doing certain deeds, you tell somebody that, that that's not the way of salvation. You tell somebody who believes that way that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, you're going to ruffle their feathers. I don't know about you, but I got my feathers ruffled when the track told me that it don't matter how you live. It don't matter what you've done in the past. It don't matter uh, what you think you believe. All that matters is you got to realize you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you don't trust Christ to be your Savior, you're going to go to hell. That ruffled my feathers. But that's also what helped turn my world upside down. You know, I thought, well, I'm a good boy. I make good grades, I can play baseball, I'm in college, I got a scholarship, I'm an athlete, I've never been arrested, I don't have any illegitimate kids, uh, I don't do drugs, I don't uh, drink alcohol. Uh, I thought, well, if anybody's going to go to heaven, it's going to be me. And that track, Mr. Harold Beale, he ruffled my feathers. But it turned my world upside down. <clears throat> I like the word, uh, the word justified in verse 39. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things. I know you've heard this many times, but that word justified means it's just as if I've never sinned. When you get saved and trust Christ to be your Savior, you're justified. Your sin has been erased. It's like you've never sinned. So there's justification, there's also an obligation because of our salvation and because of our justification. There's an obligation you and I have, and it's the same obligation they had in the book of Acts, the early church. They were obligated. They were compelled. They were moved to. They were encouraged to. They were challenged to. God spoke to them. They heard the sermon at the sanctuary. After the scriptures were read, they believed 
them own self that Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, and His resurrection is the way to salvation. But if they were going to turn the world upside down, they couldn't keep it in here. They had to take it out there. Our obligation is not to save people. Our obligation is not to change people's life. Our obligation is not to is not to give advice and to give philosophy. Our obligation as a Christian is to take the gospel to our community and to our world and then let God turn their world upside down. Not everybody's going to believe it or receive it. By the way, all of the invitations we've given out this year, probably, I'm going to guess, about 40 or 50 bundles already from our church. If everybody who got one of those came to church, we wouldn't have enough room. If everybody we gave a track to got saved, we wouldn't have a big enough altar for folks to come to to admit uh, to to uh, to talk about their salvation. If everybody who we gave an invitation to and gave a track to uh, truly trust, trusted Christ and truly got saved, we wouldn't our, our baptistry it would tear up. So our job is not to save everybody. Our job is not to is not to uh, uh, change everybody's life. Our job is to take the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is found right here in the scriptures, to everybody we come in contact with. The communication of the church. Would you stand to your feet, please, tonight? Every head.